Hi, I'm George and welcome to part four of the Typhoon series. This week, we're gonna continue working on the pressure chamber. We're gonna add some very important components to it. And we also get to make a set of fins. So anyway, let's get started. The first thing we need to do is reinforce the shock cord mounting point. We take a piece of Delrin and machine it down to the size to fit inside the 3D printed tube on top of the pressure chamber. We don't want to rely on the 3D print by itself and a fairly thin piece of fiberglass to be able to take the shock loads when the parachute opens. This reinforcing ring should take the loads quite easily. It gets glued into the top with 24 hour epoxy. Then we drill a hole through for the pin that will hold the end of the shock cord. The pin itself is made from a 6mm diameter Dynabolt. We use a removable pin like this to make it easier to connect and disconnect the shock cord. It's just a friction fit to keep it in place. And that's the shock cord mount point finished. Now about a month ago, we were deciding what to make the fins out of. To make things simple, we decided to make them out of G10 fiberglass sheet. We found some reasonably priced sheets on eBay and placed an order. It was only going to take two weeks for them to arrive and so we had plenty of time to work on other things. So fast forward to today with less than two weeks to go and the fiberglass sheets nowhere in sight, we decided to make our own in order to make launch day. Luckily we had everything we needed on hand and so we first cut out a couple of pieces of 3mm plywood that was going to form the inner core of the fins. 3mm plywood by itself is a bit weak and bends quite easily so we needed to reinforce it. We're adding a couple of layers of plain weave carbon fiber cloth with each of the layers oriented at 45 degrees to each other for extra stiffness. We're also adding an extra couple of layers of fiberglass to save costs. The first layer of fiberglass that goes down is 200 GSM plain weave with its fibers oriented at 0 and 90 degrees. The next layer is bias cut carbon fiber. We're using our regular West Systems epoxy for this with the slow hardener. The next layer is 0 and 90 degree sheet of carbon fiber. And finally we add the bias cut 85 GSM fiberglass cloth for a smoother top finish. On top of that we put a sheet of baking paper and press out all of the air bubbles. We then use a piece of PVC pipe to squeegee out the rest of the bubbles and evenly spread the epoxy. We then flip the whole thing over and repeat the same sandwiching process on the other side. We then again add a second piece of baking paper and squeeze out all of the bubbles as much as possible. We didn't use peel ply because that leaves a much rougher finish and needs more sanding. We then sandwich everything between two thick plates of glass to keep everything straight and flat and add weights to compress it further. The next day we can remove the glass plates and peel off the baking paper to give us a fairly smooth finish. Though the finish is not shiny, it was good enough to fly without needing any more work. We can now trace the fin patterns onto the sheets. The fin size was determined using open rocket to make sure that the rocket remains stable for both solid motors as well as when it flies as a water rocket. Then we cut out the basic shapes of the fins. We used a hacksaw for this and although it dulled by the end of the third fin, it wasn't too bad. To save time, we decided not to do any contouring of the leading and trailing edges, as this isn't a performance rocket, and with the fins being fairly thin, it wouldn't have made much of a difference anyway. 
and here are the three fins cut out. The next step was to shape the fins to the curved part of the end cap. This was done easily with a Dremel tool to give it that rounded shape. The way we're mounting the fins is specifically designed to make them more rigid compared to if they were just attached with a straight root cord. This arrangement also gives extra lateral support to the motor mount tube. We'll see how these fins are attached in a future video. Next up we need to make the mounting bracket ring that will attach the payload bay. We make this from the same PVC pipe that the mandrel was made from. This is just the easiest way to do this because it's exactly the right size to slide into the payload bay tube. The length of this ring is about 55 millimeters. When attaching this ring to the top of the pressure chamber it's critical to get the alignment right otherwise the whole payload bay and nose cone could end up tilted to one side. For this we use three aluminium angles spread evenly around the top of the pressure chamber and we hold these down with strong rubber bands. Then we put the ring inside of the payload bay tube and dab a few spots of 5 minute epoxy on it and slide that down between the aluminium angles. This tacks the ring in place with the correct alignment. Once that is set, we pull off the payload bay tube and the aluminium angles and then proceed to fill the joint with a stronger 24 hour epoxy and wrap over it with electrical tape for a smoother finish. Once that's cured, we stand the entire pressure chamber upright. We had to do it here on the stairs so that we could easily get to the top of the pressure chamber. We then pour more West Systems epoxy into the space between the pressure chamber and the ring. This gives the ring extra strength for when the payload's jerked sideways during parachute deployment or when it hits the ground. We let this cure overnight. And here is a cross-sectional diagram of where the epoxy ends up. Now we need to make a simple retaining ring for the outside of the nozzle. At least it would be simple if our lathe was just big enough. Our chuck is too small to hold this 76mm diameter aluminium stock. So the only way to grip it is to screw on an adapter. We already had this adapter, but we needed to enlarge the holes for bigger screws. Of course the bigger screws didn't fit the adapter, so we had to machine down those screws to make them fit. Don't need it. Once the adapter was attached, we were able to mount it in the chuck. The cross slide and cutting tool barely fit, but we were able to machine it down to the right diameter. This diameter was still 5mm too big for the chuck to grab. We then drilled out the center hole, which was still okay with the plastic adapter. But both Dad and I knew it couldn't support the part when we started enlarging the hole. So the only thing left to do was to make a new adapter out of brass. After carefully choosing the right stock, we spent 30 minutes machining it, only to realize that it was 2 millimeters under what we needed. So we had to start again and machine a second adapter, and this time we were able to make the right size holes to match the ones already in the aluminium part. We basically spent one and a half hours just trying to grab this thing in the lathe. Then it took another hour and a half enlarging the hole. We had to do shallow cuts so that the lathe wouldn't stall. So what would take 30 minutes in a large lathe, this took us close to five hours when we were done. Then we punched out the centers for the screw holes. The ring was then glued onto the end of the motor tube. This ring provides the sheer strength for the screws that hold the nozzle in place. Without this ring, the screws would just rip through the relatively thin fiberglass tube. At 400 psi, there would be about 6.8 kilonewtons or 700 kilograms force pushing on it. The last step to attach the nozzle was to drill holes through the retaining ring and tap holes in the nozzle itself. We made up this wooden jig and secured it to the bench drill. This exactly aligned the tube with the center line of the drill and only allowed the drill to go down to the right depth. We started off by drilling one hole. 
Then we proceeded to tap that hole and inserted a screw. This would make sure that the nozzle didn't move while we drilled the rest of the holes. Then one by one, we drilled out and tapped the rest of the holes. To keep the holes in the ring centered with the holes in the nozzle, we were using the smaller diameter drill bit and tapping a thread in the outer ring at the same time. Once all the holes were tapped, we then used a bottoming tap to get the thread all the way out to the bottom of the hole. And the last step was to enlarge the holes in the ring to remove the thread so that the screws could be pulled tight against the nozzle. We put a couple of o-rings on the nozzle before inserting it into the motor tube. Sorry, I didn't get footage of us pushing it in. And here are the six screws holding the nozzle in place. So that's it for this week, maybe not the most exciting video, but it's here for completeness so that you can see all of the components getting built. Uh, next week we're going to have a look at the parachute deployment mechanism. So anyway, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.